I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're about to hear a single chapter of an ongoing fantasy narrative, one I've written to be heard, not read. There's no music, sound effects, or character actors. It's all me, and I do it in one single flawless take. Scald picks up right where we left off last time, so you might consider going back to listen to previous episodes to catch up before you go much further. It's not a prerequisite, though. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 11. The harpoon flew through the air in a flash, embedding itself deep into Maul's heavily muscled thigh, tearing through the elk leather armor as if it were nothing more than gossamer. The weapon hit with a force only possible in the surreal dreamscape, driving the savage back into his knees as his leg exploded in pain and Maul exploded with a mighty, tormented howl. Traum stood above him, smiling, chuckling, proudly surveying his quarry like one who hunts for sport, not survival. With the grizzled hunter moving steadily toward him, Maul wrapped his hands around the harpoon's weather-beaten shaft, gritting his teeth in anticipation of the coming agony. And then, he pulled. But though he pulled with all the might he could muster from a position of such poor leverage, the harpoon would not move. Maul yanked and he shook, but succeeded only in burying the barbs on the harpoon's head further into the thick muscles of his thigh gasped as his efforts produced nothing but a steady stream of blood that poured out of his elk leather leggings, then fell to the ground where it was thirstily sucked up by that shifting, multi-hued beach. (laughs) Not every problem can be solved by force, beast. You'd think that a true king would know that already. The harpoon was still buried in his thigh. Fortunately, it had missed the bone, and the explosive power of Maul's legs had yet to leak out fully. So he leapt, flinging himself at Traum, arms outstretched, fingers splayed, knowing that if he could just put his hands upon his adversary, then yes, this problem, like so many others he had run headfirst into in the past, could indeed be solved by force. But just before his fingers made contact with the shimmering, dream-beast skins that Traum wore draped around himself, Maul found himself violently stopped, then flung to the ground. Traum had used the harpoon, dropping to a crouch, then seizing it with both hands, using Maul's very momentum to swing him into a crashing, tumbling, confused heap. The skin of his face ripped and torn by the rough, porous rocks that had just recently developed a taste for the savage's blood. Maul pushed himself up with one hand, a low growl growing in his throat as he reached his other hand down to the loop at his belt, the one that held his cherished cudgel. When he went to grasp it, his calloused hand closed upon nothing but the salty sea air. I wouldn't expect anything different from you. When all you have is a club, Traum tossed the cudgel in the air, spinning it like a baton, in a careless act of disregard for the weapon's true origins and powers, before catching it by its handle once again. Obviously, brute force would be your only tactic. Maul once again set upon the harpoon, desperate to remove it from his leg and bring more of his mobility into the fight. But though he tried to wiggle the barb out and even attempted to tear it straight out of his flesh, the harpoon would not budge. Tricks. Ah! Cowardly tricks by a warrior unable to stand on his own might. (laughs) Trickery. 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 Trickery is just another name or tactics, one given to them by those two stupid to make proper use of them. The luminescent green skies of the dreamscape began to fill with angry, purple clouds, pregnant with the type of storm that made even city dwellers quake in fear, huddled under blankets, 
high up in their gleaming towers. Ah, so I see you have some tricks of your own, then. Matters not. It will make no difference in the end. Admit it, Maul. You are outclassed. I have spent a lifetime preparing for you, and all that you can do now, the only thing you have left for you, is to suffer. As the clouds blotted out the mysterious light of that glowing sky, the sea began to boil and shout, spitting foam up into the air as the waves crashed angrily down upon the shore. Traum watched the growing storm bemusedly as heavy raindrops began to fall all around him. Meanwhile, Maul put one hand at the site of his wound and wrapped the other around the harpoon at the point closest to his leg. If he couldn't remove the barbs, he would at the very least get rid of this encumbrance, the one that slowed him and made him susceptible to Traum's craven attacks. Maul let out a rising roar. It melded with a peal of thunder that crashed through the salty ocean air, growing thick with rain and humidity. And as he did so, a bolt of lightning burst out of one of those fat, quivering purple clouds, tearing through the sky, leaving a vacuum in its wake as it shot down toward the earth and its target. The grizzled hunter, Traum. Traum proved himself quicker than lightning at least in this realm, as he deftly skipped to the side, allowing the lightning to blast the ground where he had stood momentarily before, kicking up scads of those porous, shifting pebbles, which then cascaded to the ground, harmlessly. Lightning? Lightning? Is that it? Traum screamed at Maul, his eyes crazed and furious. I have lived in this wild realm for Decades, and you think that a storm, a simple storm, is enough to stop me? Maul threw himself at Traum once again, but this time, he led with the broken harpoon shaft, driving the shattered, jagged end directly toward Traum's unprotected gullet. Traum was still too fast, using the cudgel to bat Maul's makeshift spear away with an impressive economy of motion, while hopping to the side once again to avoid Maul's bulky frame as it landed. Even in this realm of glorious, terrible impossibilities, the best, the best that you can come up with is lightning, nature at its rawest, its most simple, its most vulgar. Why am I not surprised? The water began to come down harder. The porous pebbles were soaked through, unable to take on any more, so the fresh water from the sky formed puddles and pools that became increasingly brackish as the rising tide of the tumultuous sea crept further and further up the beach. I beat you once, and I can do it again. Maul growled as he circled around Traum, like the giant jungle cat with whom he had spent much of his life. No, Maul, you didn't beat me. You've never faced me before. The weak, ignorant child from our first encounter. He is gone. Forever gone. Traum moved quickly, dodging the raindrops with motions that appeared as fluid as the downpour itself. That boy. He disappeared while hunting on these very unforgiving shores, evaporated as he struck down the unnamed creatures that haunt your nightmares, forever lost as he tore their bones from their bodies, then cracked and sharpened them into the very barbs gnawing away at your thigh. As the sky filled with lightning, Traum shot out a kick. The toes of his foot, wrapped in furs, collided directly upon the wound. On Maul's thigh. Before the savage could even react, the pain shot through his body, causing him to collapse to his knees as Traum slid back out of range, grinning sadistically. Maul forced himself up and began circling once again, but slower now as the water continued to rise around him with swells that climbed up to his waist. This world, your psyche, it is... It's nothing but shattered, frantic rage, and I have weathered that storm time and time again. Your rage, your power, it's predictable, and it cannot defeat me. Suddenly, Traum stood upright, 
ceasing those fluid motions, then flung the cudgel at the water-covered ground between he and Maul. And now your rage, your utterly predictable rage, is the only weapon that you have left. Maul went to die for his cudgel. It had been a life raft in worse places than this, and he would have it perform the same function here. But before he could take a second step, much less dive into the climbing waters, the ground at his feet began to shake violently. Something deep beneath the pebbles was moving, growing, snaking outward. The roots were the first thing to burst up out of the ground, and they did so directly beneath Maul's feet, tossing him and the porous pebbles he stood upon up out of the water and up into the air, heavy with humidity electricity, and hate. But when Maul came back down, splashing into the water, the rocky beach was gone. And where it had been, there was only ocean. Cold, dark, impossibly deep. He fought up from the depths, back to the surface, breaking through the water with a gasp, sputtering and flailing as he rubbed the salt from his eyes, just in time to see the top of a mighty ash tree emerge from the water, shooting upward, sprouting branches as it went, with the hunter Traum clinging to the top, cackling as he ascended. Maul swam as well as he could pulling his body through the waves with his exhausted arms, propelling himself forward with kicks weakened by the barb still embedded in his thigh, the wound searing and stinging from the salt water that surrounded him. But in the time it took Maul to reach the ash that towered above this now endless ocean, it had continued its growth, and the dream hunter Traum was out of sight, but not out of earshot. Your strength, your power, they, they're all meaningless here. Don't you see? Look how easily I have risen above your rage. Can you even hope to attempt the same? With no other choice before him, Maul did as he always did. He did what he must. Slowly, steadily, with his joints aching from exhaustion, their vitality sapped by that roiling, icy seawater. Maul put one hand above the other, braced himself as well as he could, and he climbed. Stuck on a mighty ash tree, imprisoned in a realm that was not his own, it was not a foreign sensation to Maul, who had spent a decade of his life hanging from the world tree by the order of that cruel, elven tyrant. The hateful familiarity of his situation shook Maul to his core, and his body quivered, urging itself beyond its natural limits, summoning up a strength from reserves that were empty, but a moment before. (laughs) You find yourself here, in a world both terrible and magical beyond all imagination, and all you can think is to make yourself stronger? Though Traum remained out of sight, despite Maul's now prodigious ascent, his voice was as clear as ever, reverberating off of the sprouting and blooming ash branches that surrounded Maul. Though Maul was pushing himself to the point of complete and utter exhaustion, he suddenly realized that breathing was unnecessary in this bizarre, treacherous realm, the realm of his dreams. So he shouted, He roared. Strength is all I've ever had. It's all I've ever needed. Maul pulled himself up upon a mighty branch, and in doing so, found himself face to face with a simple squirrel. As he did so, Traum's voice rang out again. Anyone can cultivate strength. Any mean beast can summon up great reserves of power, and every time... They will be felled without fail by a beast even mightier than they. As Maul pushed himself to his feet, expecting to tower over the small, curious squirrel before him, he found the opposite occurring. 
Whether he shrank or the tree and squirrel grew impossibly large around him, Maul was unable to tell, and he was consumed with confusion as the massive arboreal rodent slammed into him, causing the thought to rattle wildly around his skull. It was all Maul could do to keep the beast's frothing jaws away from his face. Though the squirrel rent and tore at his armor and the skin beneath, Maul saw that the true threat was in those teeth honed on nuts and acorns that at this scale were like unto boulders. So Maul placed both hands on the creature's fur-covered throat and he locked his elbows, anything to prevent the monster from cracking open his skull and feasting upon the soft pink gore then. Struggling to sit up and force the squirrel off him, Maul saw beyond the monster, where Traum emerged from a hole in the tree's trunk, hopping down to join the savage his savage attacker. There's always something bigger, something stronger, something more powerful than even you, Maul. And here, I can summon it up as easily as thinking of it. Desperate to get at its prey, the squirrel swiped a massive paw across Maul's face, hoping to draw the warrior's hands away from its neck, allowing it to plunge its teeth downward in a quick, bloody, murderous strike. Maul was not some coward to recoil from violence, not some vain fop to protect his appearance at all costs. No, Maul was a warrior, and thus he understood the concept of attrition. He was not afraid of a pyrrhic victory, as long as it was indeed a victory. So as the monster's paw passed across Maul's face, leaving deep, bloody tears upon it, Maul moved his head into the strike clamping his teeth down tightly upon the dirty, musty fur of that giant rodent. The beast let out an ungodly shriek as Maul's teeth sunk through its stiff, wiry hair and into its flesh, releasing the wild blood that coursed through it, which flowed into Maul's waiting mouth, awakening, igniting, and fanning the flames of that which had set Maul's tribe apart in the eons gone by. The blood with its hot iron taste. It struck at something at the core of Marl's being, something that even there, in a maddening, senseless dream realm, where the sky and ground switched places of their own accord, something that even there contained an irresistible force, an unstoppable juggernaut of rage that filled Maul's limbs with untold, unnatural strength. With a quick movement, Maul released the still shrieking monster. But before the squirrel could react, Maul's balled-up fist struck it directly in its neck, collapsing its throat in a sudden flash of violence. Strength is nothing. Despite not having needed to breathe earlier, now Maul, connected with something deeper and more primal than even his dreams, panted. Without the will to drive it climbed quickly to his feet, glanced at the wheezing squirrel that lay next to him on the branch, and then began to move slowly, calculatedly, toward the dream hunter, Traum. Meanwhile, Traum, grinning, produced another harpoon from the trunk of the ash tree. And what, pray tell, is a will without a mind to direct it, imagination to give it form, artistry to create something from nothing. You have none of these. You have none of them, and you cannot beat me here, Maul. I will see this be your end. Maul struggled to understand. But why? With me dead, with no mind to create this world, what would become of you? Traum, furious that Maul would strike to the core of his dilemma, of the hellish choice he had before him, shouted at the heavens, I don't know and I don't care. Because anything, anything would be better than the living, literal nightmare that I have endured alone these past decades. Maul, creeping closer, but remaining wary of the harpoon that Traum still wielded, began to speak. 
but was soon interrupted by a repetitive booming that shook the massive tree that they stood upon. What? What is that? What have you summoned now? Whatever it is, I shall summon up the strength required, and I shall defeat it. Traum laughed. He laughed hard. He cackled, planting the harpoon upon the branch to brace himself so as not to buckle completely over in his hysterics. <laughs> oh, Maul, how, how perfect this is. I didn't summon anything. What you hear, what you hear so clearly, it's you. It's your own body, the very thing that you rely upon, the very strength that you hold so dear. It's you turning upon yourself. Maul, confused looked down to find the source of the deafening noise as it grew ever closer. He gazed down past the branch he stood upon. And he saw it. He saw himself. They were unspeakably high, more in space than in the sky, and Maul could swear that he had passed by a star on his rage-fueled climb. Though the tree scratched the heavens themselves, Maul and Traum were barely above the giant. It was indeed Maul, but a Maul magnified, exaggerated, distilled to its essence and multiplied in its grotesquerie, all fuming rage and senseless destruction with a face made up of nothing more than a gaping, hungry mouth and wholly black, soulless eyes. The mindless giant, the automaton ogre swung a meaty fist upward, striking the branch that Maul, Traum, and the squirrel still stood upon. Maul and Traum scrambled, desperate to clench the rough bark and find purchase, but the still wheezing rodent was not so lucky, and it cascaded down into the waiting mouth of that ravenous monster. I don't understand. What is this? What evil have you summoned now, Traum? You'll kill us both! Don't you see? Don't you understand? I have summoned nothing. This, this thing, like everything here, like everything you have ever suffered through, is your own doing. You made your choice when you threw in with him. You made your choice when you did his bidding, when you allowed me to die, and when you, the ignorant, foolish savage, filled your stupid gut with poisonous berries. <laughs> you allowed your hunger to be your undoing because of course you did. It's so, so very like you. And I should know, for I've been inside your maddening simpleton brain for longer than you have even been alive. The giant, momentarily distracted by the squirrel that he had crushed in his slavering jaws, now turned his hunger to the giant tree, biting through that unnaturally ancient hardwood, the crunches and cracks ringing in Maul's ears. It's true. The illness is kicking in faster than I had expected. Quicker than I had hoped. I thought we'd had more time here. Hoped we'd have more time together, but no matter. Time is fluid here, and I can make of it everything that I wish. And anyways, it all ends in the same place. Regardless, it ends in the same place. That inky, black void of nothingness. Maul wasn't afraid of death. He had come close enough to that inky, black void of nothingness to no longer fear it. He saw it as an old friend, an estranged relative, one he knew that he would one day join, whether he liked it or not. One that when the time was right, he would embrace, breathing a sigh of relief. But he would be damned if that day was today. He was a warrior, a proud one. He would willingly die with a sword to the heart, with a club to the head, with an axe to the gut, even filled with cowardly arrows let loose by a craven opponent. But he would not die while sleeping. He would not have that coward's death. Mortality is what makes us human. Our fleeting existence is a 
gift that gives sweetness to all of life's bitterness. To take leave of our only life while unconscious, while unable to come to grips with the crushing absurdities, the irreconcilable contradictions of life, it is to be robbed of something crucial. Our humanity. Frantic, with his own strength turned against him, devouring himself and everything within, Maul began to search for another option, another path, another way out. Traum, listen to me. The dream hunter, though he hated Maul with every fiber of his being, was not immune to his commands. Those issued with the confidence and pride that come not from sitting upon a throne, but from the all-consuming desire to. So Traum silenced his laughter, and he listened, staring daggers at the king of men. There has to be a way. Can't we, can't we move your consciousness to another body? Only a dream master can do that, and they are all hidden away in their colleges. The tree began to shake as the giant sunk its teeth into the trunk of that great ash. Where? Where is it? Where's the college? Traum saw what Maul intended. There's one in every realm. Maul grinned as he saw the path that he must take and the leather which which to apply the pressure necessary to open it up. And your dream masters, can they travel between the realms? Freely? Can they bring whatever, whomever they wish? Yes, of course. The Dream Masters are more powerful than ones such as you can imagine. The tree shook violently, casting Maul and Traum both down upon the branch, arms and legs splayed out to prevent a deadly fall. Maul, unwilling to stand back up and put all of his faith in balancing upon his wounded leg, crawled to Traum. Listen now. Listen well. Listen quickly. I had no ill will toward you. You must believe that. I only did as I must to get to my home realm, to my kingdom. It is my only concern, my only goal. So, what do you ask of me? Beast? Murderer? I will travel to your kind's college. I will subject myself to whatever the Dream Masters require in order to rip you from my brain and place you in a new body. Oh, and what body would I be given? I don't know. I don't know, and I don't have time for these games. Don't you see? Do you wish to live or not? Is a cowardly death when you confront while asleep? Is that all that you wish for yourself? If I get you a new body, will you have your master send me to a new realm or not? The trunk of the tree, under constant assault from the giant, began to give way, cracking and shattering, the tree falling askew, with Maul and Traum hanging on for dear life. That is the deal. Listen to me. It is the only one that I can offer. The only one that can save us both. Will you take it or not? If so, then release me now and allow me to release you. The giant's massive hand reached up and grabbed a branch next to the one that housed Maul and Traum, ripping it from the tree before shoving it down into its cavernous maw. There was no time to spare. But Traum spared a moment for thought nonetheless, as the giant devoured everything around them, sucking the light and the air itself into its gaping mouth. Traum dropped his harpoon unceremoniously and placed his palms together. It must be placed in the mouth of a waiting, unconscious host. It must be done properly, prepared exquisitely to prevent unending, incurable madness. Take it to the college. Ask for the finest, most highly trained master that they have. The giant roared up at them, his hot breath threatening to knock Maul and Traum both from the branch. The college. Where is it? Tell me. There's no time now. 
see you in your dreams, and I will tell you there. Traum opened his hands, revealing a glowing gem of amber, a soul stone, which he pressed into Maul's waiting hands. After my time here, after the unending misery, after a lifetime lost, I do not forgive. But if you do this task properly, I shall try to forget. Maul pocketed the soul stone and nodded. But before he could say a word, Traum plunged his fingers into the wound on Maul's leg, digging deep and grasping the barbs of the harpoon that had struck him. Traum ripped them out, tearing Maul's already tattered flesh, causing the savage to gasp and howl in pain. There. There's nothing keeping you here now. And with that... Traum seized his harpoon and leapt off the tree into the waiting darkness, confident that he could dream up whatever necessary to escape from the giant and save himself. Maul, Traum's soul stone in hand, panicked as the ash tree cracked again and his branch plummeted downward toward the gaping mouth of his uninhibited self, of his murderous, self-destructive hunger, the roar of rage flowing freely out of it, blasting Maul's eardrums. He clenched his eyes shut and he let out a roar of his own. When he opened his eyes, Maul found that it was not a roar that left his lips, but a torrent of bile forced up by a sickness that sat deep in the pit of his stomach, clutching his intestines with talons tipped in poison. He coughed, his throat trembled, and his torso convulsed as his body attempted to void itself of that which had tormented it. With Traum's soul stone still clenched in his hand, Maul used the back of his fist to wipe the foul liquid from his mouth and the tears from his eyes. And then he heard the voice. This was a poor place to sleep, a very poor place to sleep. The monk, wrapped in worn, threadbare robes, stood scowling down at Maul, and by his feet, the motionless, sprawled-out form of Skog, that evil-smelling bile stuck and matted to the fur around her mouth. And it's an even poorer place to get sick. Die. If you enjoy Scald, please leave a good review on iTunes, Stitcher, or preferably both. Good reviews get the show featured more often, which gets more people listening and hopefully leaving reviews of their own. Rinse, wash, repeat. Scald is made available for free every Thursday, but if you want the free content to keep flowing, you need to support the show on Patreon. By signing up, you can pay as much or as little as you want for the show each month, and it gets automatically taken out of your credit card. To sign up or for more information, head to patreon.com scald. If you're enjoying Scald and want even more serialized oral content, you should absolutely check out Rude Alchemy on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or rudealchemy.com. It's an audio drama melding history, mystery, horror, and comedy. While Scald is Conan the Barbarian is read by Ultimate Warrior, Rude Alchemy is more a Monty Python meets Sir Arthur Conan Doyle type thing. Very different Conans, but very good nonetheless. New episodes drop every other Sunday, but I'd suggest you start with Bruff Tax Win, Sky Sailor, episode number five, as it features a cameo from your favorite long-haired maniac. Me. I'm talking about me. Seriously, go check it out and find Rude Alchemy on Facebook and Twitter at Rude Alchemy. You can also find me on social media. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, they're all Aubrey Sitterson. A-U-B-R-E-Y-S-I-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. No spaces, no numbers. Or head over to my website, AubreySitterson.com, for links to everything, including social media, my non-scald-related projects, comics, podcasts, t-shirts, credits, bio, and contact information. Finally, if you're enjoying Scald, please tell everyone you can. I rely on your positive word of mouth to keep the show growing. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.